My name is Karina Kalm, and I am so excited to come and talk to you today. That's, uh, I see myself as an explorer type, like a treasure hunter, and that's why this talk is called Sink or Swim. Uh, it's a privilege to come and speak with you today. Uh, I've been at home with, living with an immune compromised person, so I haven't been around as much as I'd like to. Um, I, I honestly can't believe that GDC is reaching 24,000 people, I last checked. So I've been feeling a lot more introspective and quiet as of late after quitting my awesome job at Electronic Arts. Last year, I left that to start a new role. And so it felt like I had uh, jumped off a bridge onto a fast moving ship. And there was a lot of pressure on me to deliver something very fast so we could support our team. Uh, this is not a sponsored talk. Um, but I would love to take this opportunity to show you uh, what our team's been working on. I don't want audio. Oh. There we go. Uh, so I'd love to show you what our team's been working on and how we were able to put together a playable game demo in just 12 months. So this is never, never before seen footage for our upcoming closed beta in April. I am a video game director working in the crypto game space, but I have a background in traditional game development. Uh, I've seen my share of quality assurance, game design, production, and project management. So this gives me a unique superpower to be able to skirt in and out around the shores of game development and also sail into the ocean. So by the end of this talk and by the end of GDC, I hope you will think of me as your well-seasoned captain steering a ship towards a game development horizon. Along the way, I will share what I've learned with you on how to validate fast as a metaphor for sailing into the ocean. I'm very lucky to have worked with a number of teams and I have close ties with gaming communities, guilds, colleagues, and fans, but I never, ever would have thought that I would be here today speaking to you at GDC. Just a quick survey of hands. How many of you already have a game concept that's in production? Great, great. And how many of you have a game concept that you would like to, to launch in the near future? Awesome. Okay, and the last question. Uh, how many of you are students who are looking to get your foot in the door and get some experience? Awesome. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you so much for being here today to my talk. I know there are a lot of incredible and amazing talks out there, and it's, it's really flattering that you came here. And if you're a student, um, thank you so much for stopping by to try to learn something from my experience. Um, so what you will hear today is an amalgamation of everything I've learned with my background in the games industry for over 16 years. Um, I make it a commitment every day to work with globally diverse teams, and I carry my knowledge as transparently as I can. Uh, in my journey, I try to help people to do their best work. I've had a few jobs in the past, such as I used to work for a radio station, and then I worked for a ski resort, and, Anyway, I really cut my teeth working for indie and AAA teams, reporting to some of the most creative and inspiring directors from uh, smaller to massive IPs. Uh, I can tell you that I've been where you are today. Maybe you are looking for a new job or you're thinking about starting a new game in your, your downtime. Um, I just want to tell you that you're not alone. So I'm just going to cut through the bullshit because the crypto games industry is highly volatile. Uh, there are a lot of buzzwords that are floating around. Some of them don't mean anything at all. They don't make any sense. Uh, that, again, that's why seeing you here today is very flattering. 
In spite of what you may or may not know about Web3 or crypto or the metaverse, this talk is all about how to validate fast and how to have fun, how to make sure that your players are having fun. Moving from traditional game development, uh, I saw an opportunity to bring what I've learned from traditional game production uh, and equal representation and bring it into this space. Um, so that's why I decided to quit my awesome corporate job to join a startup and become, uh, and become an indie and then launch our game using actual blockchain to power our, the technology of our in-game economy. To be clear, I am not telling anyone to quit their job. I'm just telling you what I did. Uh, as the game director, I am accountable for the overall player experience and the overall satisfaction of our players. I make sure that our teams can deliver and achieve high quality standards across many game disciplines. Um, and I work with the uh, marketing team to promote and build interest for our game. Our game does use NFTs, but today I will not be discussing anything about that. If you are interested in learning more, then you should definitely check out our Mixmob booth today at P1873. Please bring coffee or donuts. Uh, the second to last interesting fact about me is that I'm also a long-standing events director in the not-for-profit space, uh, where I get to represent the underrepresented groups who are LGBT, Q, plus, women, and Asian. Uh, it's kind of a weird flex, because there's still a lot of work to get done. Um, but all of that is to say that I truly appreciate uh, how much time and effort goes into making uh, these events come to life. So thank you, volunteers and selection committee. Okay, so back to sailing away. Uh, who is ready to dive into the deep sea? Woohoo! I know every team will encounter a number of game development challenges, and that's why my number one goal today is to share as many stories as I can that you can use as a leader or a product owner or even as a producer. Today, you're going to learn about all the techniques I've used to make sense of the game development world, uh, because just like you, I too have opened up Jira only to discover that the project wasn't fire. <laughs> uh, and this kind of experience transcends every project. So I'll share my hard-won secrets with you today in the space dealing with technical issues, limited resources, uh, tight deadlines, and scope creep. And if anything of what I've just said resonates with you, uh, again, just remember, you are not alone. Uh, a close friend and mentor of mine, just sitting right there, James Mowat, uh, told me that smooth sailings do not make for skilled sailors. So just remember that. So using Mixmob as the cornerstone example, there we go. Using Mixmob as the cornerstone example of how to validate fast um, Mixmob is the game that I currently work on as the game director. Uh, it's about a futuristic survival remix game with references to meme culture, fashion, and music. Our first IP is uh, it's a gaming subgenre, spinning card battling and card running together. It's kind of like a Clash Royale meets a Super Mario Kart or an endless card or endless runner meets card game. We shipped the first alpha last year while we were still working on beta technology. Uh, and beta for the millennials is, is the step after alpha. It should only happen when two stages of development, being a mommy alpha and maybe another mommy beta, fall in love and they move on to a later stage in life. Uh, they change their, their status from early access to launch. <laughs> Uh, everyone is so fast moving these days, so if you've joined a new team or are trialing a new technology, perhaps you are also creating a new IP, everything that you will learn from how to validate fast will be applicable to you. In my talk, we're going to learn three big takeaways on how to validate AA games fast. Uh, there will be some time for Q&A after if we go over time. There's a room just over there that we can hang out in. And just to reiterate, um, you can find us at the Mixmob booth at P1873. Oh. Okay, uh, disclaimer, <laughs> what you will learn, your results may vary. 
So at Mixmob, uh, the vision of our card racing strategy game came together after creating a lean canvas and a one pager. A, a one pager uh, is like a compass because they both share a simple utility and they are tools that are used to point you in a specific direction. A good one pager is concise and it is easy to read. It also includes a high level feature goal because space is limited. It's instrumental in condensing your information for key stakeholders uh, and to condense all of your key takeaways into an easily digest digestible uh, one pager. Um, so I won't be able to go into every detail, but here is the anatomy of a one pager. At the very least, when you are creating a one pager, you should include about 80% of what you see here today. So this is an example of a one pager and the one pager that made me want to quit my job. Uh, notice that our game does not look anything like this at all, but the feature goals are very easy to read. So this made my job as a, a game director very easy. And if you look at this sentence right here, you can see that uh, deck building adds strategy element to vehicle racing combat. This sentence alone made uh, the direction for our team very clear. Combined with the pitch, our concept was something that could ha have shape and we could build on. Uh, the next thing, if a one pager is like a compass, then the next vital instrument is a lean canvas, which is like your map. Any good adventurer worth their salt knows that before you go on a big adventure, you need to have a map. A lean canvas can take many shapes or forms, and if you are a fan of using Google Maps, then you also know that having a lean canvas or a, a roadmap can really help you plan by providing directions and the expected time of arrival. Uh, ultimately, a lean canvas can help you visualize what's in front of you. It can help you to look out for danger, obstacles, and to avoid them. It can help you to watch out for landmarks and safe areas, and it can help you follow the most straightforward path to your destination. Because game development requires some level of awareness in order to raise funding, and I tell you, as much as I love this industry, passion doesn't pay for my cell phone bill or my mortgage, our superb CEO needed uh, me and our team to launch a game within 12 months of when I received the first one pager. So I can admit that uh, at this stage of Mixed Mobs development, not everyone will be in the same situation as I am today. Our team is very fortunate to be able to raise enough money to grow our team. But now there's a lot more on the line because we went from a team size of five people to 40. So at the beginning of our journey, I received these two one pages while the CEO and the EP were raising funds. This is what our core concept looked like at the very beginning. And then it looked like this, being a prototype. And then it looked like this. And now it looks like this. To help us get there, here's an example of an early draft of a lean canvas. This is what we used to help add value to our core concept, and it was what we used to help uh, work on the, the upcoming features. You may already be familiar with the idea, the concept of a lean business canvas. Uh, there are certainly um, multiple books on the subject from Eric Reeves, from Steve Blank, and from Ash Murray. The example from before is uh, an augmented version of the business canvas and what we use at Mixmob. And, and in case you're wondering, the big difference between what you see here and what we had uh, was that I've just simply removed revenue streams. I never claim to be good with money because I am a treasure hunter for a reason. But I can validate a game concept fast. And using this method, it enabled me and our team to focus on having fun at the same time. So notice the, these are the nine elements that we have in our lean canvas, the augmented one. Uh, let's take a step back and just dive deeper into the process of creating a lean canvas. Uh, because again, this tool is so important for your stakeholders to gain alignment. And it can also help you to strategically come up with ways to validate your concept fast. 
So at Mixmog, we thought about what we loved about racing games. They're fast paced, there's quick customization, and they're competitive. Uh, and we smashed this together with what we loved about card gameplay. And the canvas, after all that work, it pointed us towards a fast paced strategy game where card gameplay could happen in real time. And we used our art production design and UI advantages to help build out our meta loop that would then uh, attract the, and satisfy the needs of casual to mid core gamers. We brought this all together with the, the lore and the idea of remixing culture, community, uh, and uh, story all together. Okay. So I want to focus on one aspect of our Lean Canvas that's really important to me. It should be important to you too. I'm talking about the target audience slash player segment. This component in the Lean Canvas is all about bringing community together. It's all about setting up a pillar that is community first. Everyone should think about their target audience at the end of their dev cycle. Everybody should do this. This is actually not as hard as it seems today. It's much more simple these days because there are an unlimited number of ways to speak with your early adopters, even at an early stage. You can do this over Discord, you can do this over Twitter, you can do this over Telegram, you can do this over forums, you can do this over Reddit. Taking the time to truly understand your community will only lead to net positive results. It's kind of like thinking of your community being your target audience slash player segment as a pond. And the individual players inside of your community are kind of like your fish. Like a skilled sailor, knowing the types of fish that are in your pond will help you to be better prepared with the right types of baits and fishing techniques. It's really important to, to know that every player inside of your target audience will have a unique behavior, pain point, desire, um, and we'll get to that in just a moment. On a more experienced note, you should know that there is no such thing as magic bait. Learning how to reach your players is something that will take skill, but mostly practice. And you will learn that the number of players inside of your pool, player segment, will also be dependent on the complexity of the market and your business strategy. So there's no way that a, a magic formula exists, and it's, it's really hard and challenging to know uh, if there's a perfect number of players to target. What you should do, however, is pay special attention to your players uh, and appreciate them for their, uh, their desires and their friction points. To emphasize the challenge of making a fun game, especially if you are a new team, um, or you're starting a new IP, or you're trialing a new technology, or you have a new job, there will be a number of changing and unpredictable paths ahead. And that's why you should always research your players and connect with them often. Who is your community? In marketing terms, when thinking about a player segment, one should consider demographic of age, gender, marital status, again, behaviors, constraints, and more. However, in order to validate a game concept fast, I prefer to focus on just two things. The Bartle type is a gamer uh, psychology uh, and a classification of player types. It's a taxonomy that was created in the 1990s. It divides players into four subtypes. Game designers use the Bartle type to quickly identify the motivations of each player's segment. If you are a game designer, then you might be aware that there are more than the four prescribed Bartle types. But the point that I want to make here when validating fast Everyone on your team should think like a designer or consult with your design team to make sure they have an understanding of your player's segment. Because even with just four Bartle types, you will have a basic understanding of your community and there are already features that you can start to act on right away. Uh, and then the second thing is your, your, oh, yes. 
The second thing is your game platform over here. Thank you. By knowing your game platform, you can make choices before you even enter your production. This can save you countless hours of effort in your upfront design implementation. Excuse me, could you help me? <laughs> Thank you. My hands are so sweaty. Thank you so much. Okay, next up in our lean canvas. We need to figure out what the player journey is going to be and how our business plans to serve them. Uh, planning for the player journey is kind of like being a web builder who needs to use a site map in order to build a good website. Likewise, about the player journey we, in our gamer product, we need to have a good player journey, which starts with a clear destination that can outline the steps in between from the start to the finish uh, in order to reach the objective. Um, the player will experience various high points and low points of satisfaction throughout the journey. Uh, for example, a player signing in to your game, engaging in the first time user experience, or connecting with a friend to play online. This is all part of the player journey. And since we already have a couple per of personas in mind from our Lean Canvas room before, and we are community focused, we can get started on building a player journey because understanding the player journey is, is very key to the next step. You might be asking why. I'm gonna tell you why. In order to create a value proposition, we're gonna to have to need a, a player journey. So I'm gonna show you what a value proposition is. Um, and this is kind of like a monumental experience because having a value proposition is kind of like telling someone that I have something that you really, 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 really want and it's going to make you super happy. A well-crafted value proposition can help us tailor our game or product and align high-level marketing strategy to better meet the desires of our players. It helps us to reduce friction. It also helps us to reward the players with the thing that they really want that's gonna make them really happy. So here's an example of a value proposition. I personally take so much away from this exercise because uh, of this thing on the, on the right here, or I guess your left, um, called the jobs component, uh, which is kind of like the beginning of the player journey, meaning the first thing that you need to do when creating a value proposition canvas is to know first, who is your end user and what is the thing that you want them to do? We need to clearly list the objectives from the player perspective and give them a to-do list, a job. As with any new system, it's best to list out the objectives as clearly as we can while creating a player journey. This can help you a lot in the long run. Simply by identifying the customer's major jobs to be done, we're able to empathize with their pains that they face. We're able to empathize with what they're trying to accomplish in their jobs to be done and the gains and the pains they perceive when they get their job completed. So then, understanding the gains that they get and the pains that they receive from trying your, your product and your player journey and the jobs that they do, we can define the most important components of our value offerings. The value offering should be able to relieve the pain while also creating gains for our customers, players. And when we are finally ready to put it all together, we can achieve product market fit. You'll notice as you go through this exercise yourself, and I have a link for this later, every gain and pain should be met on both sides of this diagram. Every gain and pain should be connected so that we can ensure that we have valuable insights captured from our community. Here's an example of one of MixMob's quarterly planning sessions. We have a few other mechanisms that help us to, to make our deliverables successful, um, but I will save that for my next talk. Now, before I dive any deeper, I need to give a special shout out to a super cool human named Janessa Olson. 
I have rallied with Janessa to help spread the word about working as a producer slash product owner. Uh, please check out Janessa's talk in the GDC vault because she is able to break down the MVP in a very fabulous way. To be clear, I highly recommend everyone check out this talk. Start your minimum viable product with a solution. Thank you for Janessa for planting the flag. Now I am going to share the MVP in my humble way with help with a little friend. All right, quick show of hands. Who here has heard of the MVP? Okay, keep, keep your hands up. Can anyone tell me what the M stands for in MVP? Minimal. What's that? Minimal. Minimal. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, minimal or minimum. The M stands for minimum in MVP. It needs to solve a problem which is clear from the very beginning in a minimal way. Bringing this duck here was no quaxident. Uh, we're really winging this analogy to help prove a point, but I, I can't stop now. GDC is footing the bill. So this rubber duck is a toy which is used for entertainment and enjoyment inside and outside of a bathtub. Uh, one could say that the top ranking features of a rubber duck and the best rubber ducks in the world are the ones that can stay afloat much like a real duck can swim and float in the water. And before I go any further, why is quacking game production teams know that there are thousands of variations of duck toys out there and all of them bring entertainment and joy to children and adults everywhere in the world. Um, and that just means that there are countless ways to think of the MVP. But the MVP is considered a friend and a foe to many people because it is wrought with distraction and also constraints. This is where some teams will fall into the Bermuda Triangle of good production standards and that will fall by the wayside. A successful MVP uh, does require some pre-work, as Janessa Olson will tell you. The MVP should start with a solution to a problem from the very beginning. We should always look out for the most valuable offering when making an MVP. Otherwise, you might just end up gold plating your game or product and spending needless amounts of time and resources while sacrificing overall quality. To ensure that you can provide value to your players, this does involve actually talking to them. Again, this is much simpler than before. With access to social media, it's very prevalent in our day to day. And if I had to pick one aspect of validating fast, it would be simply to talk to your community. This is the key activity in validation 101. If you don't like talking to people, then I suggest we swim on over to the nearest coffee in Kalua station and get some liquid courage to help us out. But do not lose hope. Uh, we cannot abandon ship that easily. When creating an MVP, there are, are so many ways to think about bringing value to your customers or players as relative to their experience. Um, they are the ones who will be trialing your game. So when you design an MVP, always think about how this might scale up. Just like how this floating rubber duck is the precursor to something much, much bigger. This is real. This is the big mama. She exists all over the world, in Detroit, also Toronto, and it can stay afloat in much rougher bodies of water. So I, I really want you to think about how your game or product can stand up in the market, float in the water, and scale up just like the big mama duck by first satisfying the core need of your player segment, and at different intervals too. When we're thinking about how to validate fast, we must always be able to deliver value. But the challenge is in managing expectations, whether it's in a bathtub or it's in the, in the ocean. The first version of the rubber duck, for example, is not going to be good. It, and we need to be prepared to deal with some unhappy players. This is simply part of the process. 
We must float on, we must sail towards all kinds of feedback. And if you do hear any negative feedback about your game or product, I just suggest that you let it roll off your back just like water rolls off a, well, a duck. You get the picture. Until the MVP can bring true value to our player segment, it's a good idea to keep iterating and iterating and iterating as you move from alpha to beta. So one last thing that I have to tell you about the minimum Viola product is that this does not imply thinking inside of the box. When it comes to story, brand, and identity, this is something that can demonstrably separate you from your competitors. And that's why, just to iterate, understanding the core value of what people want in your game or product is key to building an MVP so that you can scale up and add your brand and identity on top. So let, let's slow it down again and get into some nitty gritties. This is some technique. Can anyone tell me what is the definition of a prototype? Anyone tell me that? Good, so you said an early version of your product? Yes, that's great. It's an early version or a sample of a product, service, or system. That's great. And the goal of the, uh, the prototype is to quickly test and to validate your concept or idea. Uh, prototyping can take many, many different forms, whether it's a sketchbook or it's a, a more advanced uh, mock-up uh, until you move into a more you know, physical or digital mode. Uh, a prototype is really cheap to make. It's actually much more cheaper than MVP. And we don't need expensive tools to get started. Building a prototype quickly aligns all of your stakeholders uh, and then the prototype then becomes the next jumping off point for everybody. And any feedback that you get from your prototype will help you decide if you want to move uh, and spend more time on, on your MVP. So just by using tools such as Miro, uh, plus some good prototyping practices, any game designer can create a game prototype using a variety of basic household things Again, it could be a sketchbook, it could be bits of paper and some string, it could, it could be using a 3D printer. Creating a physical prototype is really simple. Creating a digital prototype can be also completed with uh, tools like Twine or Game Builder or Unity. When we are validating fast, we must remember that the goal is to test our prototype. Again, this is much simpler with the introduction of Discord, Twitter, and social media. Even itch.io, it's an amazing platform. And all we need to do to test a, a prototype is to gather a group of potential players and observe their behavior, taking note of their unfettered opinion with deference. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, the most popular form of user testing has quickly become remote testing. But here are some other forms of testing that you should be aware of. I can't go into all the details today, but I encourage you to ask your UX team or your design team about these forms of user testing. All of these methods and forms are ways for us to test and become laser focused on what essential features are going to move the needle. Uh, and having said that, when conducting a user test, please do not try to do all of this at once. Uh, the goal is to focus on a limited number of questions. If we do not focus on a limited number of questions, then we will get too much feedback. And that's not very helpful either. So in order to get the most valuable insights and build that into your usability and experience, it's important to keep things limited and to stay as unbiased as possible so that we do not influence the actions of our playtester. All right, folks, I'm having a ton of fun here talking to you, but we're coming to the penultimate chapter. So let's finish strong. When you're out on the open sea, we are embarking on a grand adventure and we're in full view, which is kind of like filming a TV show in front of a live audience, 
except the audience stays there even after the cameras are off. Nothing is rolling. There is no laugh track. It can be the same thing when developing a game out in full view because your users will always be there. So we might be asking ourselves, why would anyone want to be in open view when the audience never goes away? Which sounds problematic, and it is. In spite of the implications, especially as a startup team, the reasons why we want to be out in the open in production while it's in progress um, is that we get immediate feedback, um, which saves time and money on validating assumptions fast. We also have access to super fans, which help to reduce testing cycles uh, and can help us receive game crushing bugs sooner. Uh, we get extra user testing re uh, research, which help us to map out the next step and morale improvements. Ironically, there's a different type of energy when we need to perform live, take it from me, and uh, when you're live producing content, when you successfully deliver something, it can boost all morale, it feels really good. I encourage you to do it. So as a game designer, uh, sailing out in the open is generally a good idea, but since this chapter is called Ship Fast in the Open, I am going to share some challenges to shipping fast. So one, moving fast is not sustainable because we might end up in a rush. When we are in a rush, just like you are in Sonic, if you're rushing to the end of the level, uh, you might miss a, an awesome power-up along the way. When I first joined Mixed Mob last year in March, there were five main stakeholders, including a fantastic project manager. And we were moving so fast to adjust to the, the market conditions because this was a high before the recession and before our crypto internet money fell horribly due to, to reasons. Um, I won't go into too much detail there either, um, but I really knew that I was on the cutting edge of something when I felt that stabbing pain all around. Because all of a sudden, right after Mixmob was able to secure a 40-person team with funding coming from a number of partners who all believed in, in Web3 and, and true ownership, uh, there were a number of growing pains that we had to encounter. And this probably led us to, to missing a few power-ups along the way. So as we were moving fast, we felt like we were wild raccoons getting our hands into everything, all of our ideas, everything, everywhere, and all at once. This was truly startup life. All of us moving fast as a small company got harder as we grew. As more people were being onboarded onto our vision, it meant every day when I went to work, Something new and exciting would alter our production and change our sailing angle just slightly. We were moving so fast to adapt to the grand visions of the executives who wanted a multi-massive online game, uh, the creative team who wanted an augmented reality and XR game, and the CEO who simply just wanted to get to revenue like yesterday. And that's why moving fast is effective in the short term, but it's not something that I would recommend for the long term, because our expectations versus reality will always be skewed. So now I'm gonna share some best practices on how to mitigate rushing, because on the other hand, on the other hand, moving fast is how our team was able to produce a new game with franchisable IP, and live streamable features in just 12 months. So here are the top two things you can do to avoid issues when moving fast. So first thing is get yourself a nice change request process and integrate it into your communication plan and then set up a risk register. Lastly, I need all of you to go and annoy all of your stakeholders and communicate with them. If you don't know what a change request process is, or if you don't realize the importance of a change request, then allow me to change your mind. A change request is a sexy little process, which is just a method of communication. By remembering to be inclusive of all the stakeholders who are decision makers for your project, we can avoid confusion uh, and avoid making assumptions. Here are some things that you should consider when creating your own change request. Uh, the status, 
approved, denied, or in progress. Your stakeholders, if you can call them up by name, even better. Uh, this one is the complexity or the estimation of change. And I know that there are some developers here who shiver me timbers when we think about estimations. I just hate them, and that's fine. But I say to you, you cannot change what you cannot measure. You cannot improve on what you cannot measure. Estimations are key. And then lastly, assessment notes. If you see that due to your complexity of the change request, that it, there will be an impact to your work in progress or some sort of scope displacement, uh, put them into your notes, just like that. There's more information that you can read up on change requests and change management from the Project Management Institute or PRINCE or Agile, any Agile training, you can learn about uh, change management there. Uh, the next thing that you should be aware of, there is a lot of danger and uncertainty when moving fast because of a psychological phenomenon called inintentional blindness. This was tested in an experiment called the Invisible Gorilla Experiment. Since the games industry uh, can be compared to people losing their bananas, and there's just a, a lot of monkey memes, I thought this would be relevant. Um, the monkey business illusion or the invisible gorilla illusion demonstrates that when people are focused on a particular task or object, they can become suddenly unaware of the other stimuli within their purview. Sometimes this happens when that thing is directly in front of them. So if you haven't heard of this invisible gorilla experiment, two cognitive scientists back in the 1999 created a video where they demonstrated this effect. Students were asked to pass a basketball between themselves, and viewers were asked to count the number of times the players with the white shirts passed the basketball to each other. However, what the viewer failed to notice is that midway through this exercise, a person in a gorilla outfit comes into the circle and beats their chest and walks away. It sounds absurd, I know, um, but it's one of the most famous psychological demos ever. So when we move fast, we risk inintentional blindness because we enter tunnel vision. This makes us ignore our surroundings, and although unintentional, we also fail to notice what's in front of us. Did anyone see the gorilla? You saw the gorilla? Not until I said it. You see it now? <laughs> So that's why we should have a discussion with the other leaders in our team often to talk about risks. And when I say risk, this can be positive or it could be negative. I really want us to debunk the, the myth that risk is something scary. In fact, we should embrace risks more often because there will always be uncertainties on the horizon. So that's why setting up something called a risk register is not a bad idea. It's just a process that I recommend any team to set up and add to their calendars and just to commit to doing because simply identifying risks is valuable to your team. Whether they are positive or negative, implementing a response plan to the risk that's upcoming can help us to be more prepared to transfer, avoid, mitigate, accept, or enhance the risks in our gamer product. So in this diagram here, this is a, a risk analysis. And let's say something of high consequence with high probability is about to happen very soon. Then that means our response plan is now immediate and it takes the highest priority. That means our response plan needs to happen like today or tomorrow, effective immediately. But on the other hand, if you see a risk or an event of uncertainty, which is low consequence and low probability, then you might just want to accept the risk just to keep things moving. If I could go back in time and ask the CEO of the most reputable and innovative cryptocurrency exchanges if he thought that his company would declare bankruptcy and that he would also be criminally charged with eight counts of felonies being fraud, securities, and commodities fraud, um, that would not occur to me at the time because I was so focused on making a good game. 
But even so, that is what happened. Even so. So we can't predict all risks, is what I'm trying to tell you. And that's a, a wonderful thing about risks, because whether they are positive or whether they are negative, there is value in discussing risks and adding it to what we know presently. That's why when analyzing risks, making sure that you have a response plan to address the risk can help you be more aware of political, legal, and environmental events that are just on the horizon. Positive or negative risks could rock any vessel. That's why I strongly recommend to please set up a risk register into your production as a defensive and proactive way to be prepared. And hell, if, if everything breaks loose um, and you fail, then, then so what? The greatest failure is not actually having failed. The greatest failure is neglecting to have learned anything. The best thing you can do when all hell breaks loose is to hang on to your MVP tight <laughs> and stay in the critical path and just refuse to sink. Just remember that everything worth doing takes time and Rome wasn't built in a day. My personal favorite here is a metaphor. You can't make a baby in one month with nine childbearing people. Things do and change every day. Technology will never be as slow as it is today. This slide is just here to remind you to be patient because the chances are you are not going to make a hit game on your first try. But the goal is to validate fast so that you can pivot before you run out of funding. So to wrap things up, sailing fast and in the open is challenging, but it is a unique opportunity to learn from your players and to adapt to change. Although there is no magic solution to be successful, what we need to remember above all else is to have fun. We are so privileged to work in the entertainment and creative sector. And so that's why when things get tough, I have included some daily affirmations for you. This is what has kept me afloat as the crypto market was crashing. And it's impossible to think that all of our plans will go to plan. So having a life buoy throughout this turbulent time is as simple as carrying yourself with compassion curiosity, and innovation. By the end of our 12-month runway, our team was able to use all the techniques that I've delivered to you today to incrementally increase our game production with valuable features that make our game fun to play. And since the inception of the One Pager, we have raised enough money, thankfully, through the collection of 5,000 digital assets, and we delivered our first game prototype in April of 2022. By September of 2022, players could access the game through Web3 and iOS on their phones. And by this year in January, they were able to stream live tournaments where they could also invite others through referrals to come and play, play our fun game. Oh, and we also were able to hit our goal of getting onto VR, so that happened. Huzzah! <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. If anything from my talk uh, was inspiring or interesting to you, then I can also recommend that you pick up some books here. Uh, they will explain a lot more than I can in the short amount of time that I have to, uh, about the lean canvas, the value proposition, and some critical thinking. In summary, get a compass, get a map, build a rubber duck, then ship fast and in the open. Also, take the time to know your players and have compassion for yourself. Above all else that you've learned in sink or swim, just refuse to sink. So lastly, please give it up to all the volunteers and the amazing staff at GDC with a round of applause because this is my first time at GDC. So I too have felt like I am literally sinking or swimming. Their dedication has made uh, this conference very exciting for me and just a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so... Um... I guess my question would be, how would you know whether your MVP is bringing value to your players? So the question being, how will I know when the MVP brings value to my players? Well, that's interesting because the only way that you can know whether the MVP brings value to your players is to ask them. 
it's really challenging for lots of teams to know whether their MVP delivers value to their players. You just simply have to ask them. If you find through your forms of user testing that they are positive and they're supportive of your, your upcoming feature, then that's a pretty good indicator that you, you have achieved value and product market fit. Um, but largely the only way that you can find out if this is true is just to ask them. Okay, sweet, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Hey, Hi, Karina. my name is Evan. I, I have one quick, oh, sorry. You can go. Go ahead. Thanks. You're waiting. Hey, Karina. Um, I had a question for you. So a, a lot of your talk was around uh, creating a, a prototype, an MVP for your audience. A lot of games uh, that are starting up for funding don't have an audience yet, right? They don't have that community. How do you recommend people to go about building that? Or like, what were tips and tricks that uh, Mixmob did to find a community that wanted a game like this? Okay, so the question is, uh, if you are a startup team or a new team, you're starting a new IP or you want to create an MVP, how will you find your, your target audience? How will you find those play testers? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I, I'm very fortunate to come from Vancouver, BC. Uh, there's a plethora of communities out there who will go to coffee shops, they'll go to board game stores. You can see them uh, at GDC, for example. Um, sometimes you have to go and find them. That's part of the role of a community manager and just part of your, your job effectively is to find those people uh, and validate your concept fast. Um, given that you may not have any funding to go and do this, I can see why that might be a challenge. Um, again, Twitter is a, a great place to just post up a hashtag screenshot Saturday, I think is what it's called. You can test out um, just some A-B tests of your product very quickly. Um, Itch.io is also a place that's free that you can go to and you can put your game up there and, and just try it. Game jams are another fantastic way to, to go and do that. Um, so just to iterate, you can go to a physical place, like a board game store, a coffee shop. You can go online through social media. You can also go through a platform like Steam or Itch. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Karina, my name's Evan. Um, one question I had was, what learnings, or what's your latest thinking on how much of a game's kind of stack should be on versus off-chain? Meaning, like, what parts of items should or shouldn't be NFTs versus um, benefiting from just the scale of the regular multiplayer live service stack that exists today? Like, how do you think about that? Not that accessible from a front. Other perspectives, right, that a lot of AAA games or AA game players are used to today. So just wondering, uh, based on your experience, like, what do you think going forward the optimal mix is for game devs that choose to incorporate Web3 elements? Like, what's the right mix of that on the um, back end side? Right. So, how many stacks should we use inside of our, our game if we want it to be accessible? And especially, you know, Web3 and scalable, right? Number yeah. of, of, of stacks and how do we make it scalable? Okay. That's a challenging question. <laughs> um, so, ideally, you would be on all chains all at once, everywhere at, at, at one time. But this is very challenging to do because you know it's so many servers, so many different code bases. There'd be a lot in your way as a barrier to entry. I would suggest uh, thinking about it the other way, the opposite, and just making a fun experience first. Before you go onto any chain, you have to validate that the utility of what you have to offer for any avatar system or any scalable feature in the future is is fun. So before you go onto Solana or blockchain or Ethereum or Polygon or, or whatever, um, make sure that your game does have an applicable utility for the use of a digital asset or multiplayer service uh, and try to hang in, hang in there for as long as you can before you launch onto a chain. Once you're on chain, it's really hard to come back. It's one thing I've learned about Web3 and the crypto games industry. It's kind of like building a skate park. You have to be very careful with your measurements because once it's out there, it's really hard to patch. So if you can, contain it all uh, in locally and make sure that it's fun first, then when you are ready to go into your chain, to go to everything, everywhere, all at once, um, it will be a much smoother transition. Does that answer the question? Yep, great, thanks. Thanks, Evan. 
Thank you, Karina, and congratulations on your first talk at GDC. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, we're talking about validation and failing quickly as well like, as part of that process. So how do you know when to make the call to either scale or start scaling up a product versus saying it's done and to pivot or to move on? Okay. So how, how do we know when to scale up at the different intervals? So once you should always be doing this because uh, cr creating your MVP, the first stage, it's not going to be good at all. <laughs> it might be pretty bad. Uh, and that's part of managing expectations. Um, so the first MVP we know is not going to be very good. We should always be incrementally adding value to our MVP because in the long run, this only benefits us. Um, it will add more features to your players. It will hopefully make them happy. Um, it will uh, help you to optimize your experience overall and improve on some of the things that you saw in the first MVP prototype test. Um, and it will prepare you to scale in the future. So I, I'm not sure if that's a good answer for you, um, but it, you know, start with the core nuggets of what you want to build in your MVP and make sure that it delivers value to your players. If you were successful at that point, um, there's a question about you know, talking to your players as well, how to validate that. If you are successful in proving you provide value to your players, then you should always be finding a way to include more stuff to your MVP to continue to build, always. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's all the folks, the time that we have. Thank you so much, everyone. Oh, uh, oh. one last thing. Sorry about that. One last thing. Um, there will be a GDC evaluation that will be sent to you. So if you like this talk, please go ahead and fill it out. So that you can be invited back for yeah. a second GDC talk. If you like what you hear today, I can tell you more next year.